And um, let me also say that today the doors for the service tonight will be opening at 6 p.m. The place is going to be full because we have many other visitors coming. So for our conference delegates, if you want to guarantee yourself a seat, you need to be here you know, sometime after 6, between 6 and 6.30, I think, should be, should be uh, ample time. Hallelujah. Just stand and stretch yourself for a moment. We're on the finals, final uh, lap. We need you to give Brother Ed your very best ear, your very best attention. What he has to say is of God. He's come this long way to tell you what God has for you today. You need to listen carefully. So just stretch. Do you need a minute or two, Brother Ed? Bathroom break? or should we just... almost He's almost ready, so just um, hang in there. We're right on schedule. Praise the Lord. Are you happy today? Amen. Anybody need an airplane? Don't forget. <laughs> They're on sale today. Hallelujah. Praise God. Would you give Brother Ed another round of applause? <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's such an honor to be here. I was so blessed by Brother Barry and then by Sister Tamara. I'll tell you, she is something. <laughs> and then more recently by uh, Mike. I was very blessed. I heard the passion of your heart. And what I hope God will enable me to do in the minutes that I have been entrusted with is help you bring answers to some of the questions that have been posed here by some of the speakers. And I was very blessed by Tamara uh, setting women free because uh, the devil fears women deeply. And uh, there is a book that I wrote called Women, God's Secret Weapon. And this book, in this book I show that the devil fears women so much that he has clouded the mind of theologians so that we will misinterpret every verse in the Bible that has to do with women. Because in the Garden of Eden, when God came and saw what the devil has done, he was so upset that he began to chew the devil up and told him, number one, I'm demoting you, you are cursing you, you are the least of all the animals. Number two, I'm removing your driver's license. You will no longer walk, you're going to crawl. Number three, I'm ruining your diet. You're going to eat dust. But the worst is yet to come. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her seed and your seed. Do you realize that God threatened the devil with the anger of you women? And then God announced that the rematch will take place. And when that rematch takes place, the head of the devil shall be bruised. But the one doing the bruising will not be harmed. And unfortunately, our Bible translators, in a, in a futile attempt to give more honor to the Lord, they translated, he shall bruise you on the head, when in the Hebrew it doesn't say he, in the Hebrew it says, her seed shall bruise you on the head. And by overemphasizing that we obscure the point that God is making, that in the last days, God will call forth a company of women that preach the gospel, as recorded in, in Psalm 68, and the enemies of the Lord shall be scattered. And that's why, ladies, let the Lord speak to you today and let the Lord validate you once again because in this revival that is coming, the last revival is not a male revival. It's a male and female revival because born servants and maid servants, sons and daughters, men and women will stand together in the river of God and they will be fully reconciled. That's why I encourage you, you know, get a copy of this book. This is not a book for women. It's a book about women, which means that you men need to get it. And if you need uh, some encouragement, let me tell you, in this book, I prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that God never intended you to understand your wife. 
You see, our wives are a mystery and God wants them to keep them a mystery just to keep us on our toes and to keep us on our knees, you know. The fun is not understanding them, the fun is living with them in an understanding way. So what I would like to do now, and uh, how many of you are intercessors? May I see your hands? Okay, I'm going to commit myself to you for the next 30, 40 minutes because uh, we are going to move into some intense spiritual warfare, not the kind that you see, you see demons flying in every direction, but the kind that brings down strongholds that are set in our mind. And you see in my book that none should perish, I have a chapter on strongholds, and I define a stronghold as a mindset impregnated with hopelessness that forces you to accept as unchangeable something that you know is contrary to the will of God. And here we are hearing a message, you know, and I've been so blessed, you know, last night by Rich sharing, and then this morning by the people that preceded me. But I'm sure you also sense a tension, you know, in your own mind, you know, some sort of a spiritual schizophrenia that our brother Mike captured very eloquently and described, you know. Well, if this is what God wants me to do, how can I do it? I mean, how can I still be a real person and do everything that in the Bible is real? And so what we are dealing here is with a lofty thing that has been raised in our mind to block the knowledge of God so that not all our thoughts are in captivity to the Lord and there is a lot of speculation in our mind in trying to reconcile the Word of God with our reality. We say, well, that's what it says, but let me tell you what it means. And so what I would like to ask you now, especially you intercessors, if you can be on the double praying, and I would like, if I may, you know, if I may inconvenience you briefly, would you stand up one more time? Would you hold hands with those next to you? Would you do that right now? And we are going to pray a la Argentina. And the way we pray in Argentina, we kick the devil all the way back to hell, you know. We give him a migrant headache, you know. We remind him that he has no right to be around us. So would you hold hands even across the aisles, you know, with the other folks that are there. And would you join me now praying loud and clear and that we take authority over the devil. Don't act like an anemic, bulimic, you know, uh, policeman. Take authority. So would you pray with me loud and clear, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we declare your kingdom has come and your will shall be done in the name of the Lord Jesus. We take authority over all power of the evil one. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, we take every thought captive to your obedience and we renounce every speculation that has forced us not to embrace your word. And now we say, Lord, move in my life. Change my mind. Give me a new anointing. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Father God, bless the person on my right. Bless the one on my left. Touch them. Bless them. Heal them. Deliver them. Set them free. Let your kingdom come. And we declare to the north and to the south, to the east and to the west, yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory. Forever. Amen. And give the Lord a big, big enthusiastic hand. Amen. And before you sit down, 
touch somebody, look at that person in the eye and tell that person, be blessed in the name of Jesus. Thank you so much. You know, I trust that all of you have been given some notes to use um, or try to track what I'm trying to say. Uh, just for your own peace of mind, I made those notes as self-containing as they can be, self-contained, so that you don't have to be distracted, you know, jotting down this or that. And then at the very bottom there, is our website listed and if you're interested in the powerpoints that I'm using you can either give me your business card write on it powerpoint or go to our website send me an email and I'll be very glad to send you the powerpoint I'd like to review very very quickly what we shared last night because we need to shift a major major paradigm shift because when that paradigm shifts, everything else makes sense. Remember last night we talked about that the marketplace is a combination of business, education, and government. And if we want to change a city, we need to change the marketplace. This is a very important divide because we have treated the marketplace like a cesspool. You know, and so what we do we clean people up on Sundays and then we show them how to pinch their nose on Monday, you know, and swim in dirty water with hooks trying to get some fish to bring it to church on Sunday morning to clean it up again. Praise God for that because he has brought us this far. I affirm that. But I want to bring home a point and this is what I consider to be the foundational paradigm that has to shift. Jesus did not come to seek and save the lost only. He came to seek and save that which was lost. And that means that he came to restore our relationship with God. He came to restore our relationship with each other. And in the Bible, our neighbor is not just a member of the same Bible study we go to. Our neighbor is as far away as you can get from your comfort zone. If you're a Jew, your neighbor is a Samaritan. So that the Lord came not only to bring me back to him, which is an incredible miracle, but also to bring me back to the person I may dislike the most. Osama bin Laden, Saddam Hussein. I mean, God already paid the price for us potentially to be reconciled in the spirit to the people that can be the most harmful to us. But the third thing, that this is what intercessors, I need you praying on the double, is that the marketplace, he also came to recover that. Until we understand this, all we will be planning is fishing expeditions into a polluted pool to see how much fish can we catch and clean it up and then create these holding tanks that we call churches, you know, hoping that the Lord returns before they die of some form of pollution. But when we understand that our Lord, the same blood that paid for your salvation, provided the means for you to be reconciled to everybody and gave you the grounds for you to claim the marketplace, now you begin to operate on stronger grounds. I believe that women pray more than men, not because they are more spiritual, because both of us have been created in the image of God. But women pray more, this is my observation, because what women prefer, are led to pray for has been validated worth praying for. Family, home, harmony, food, shelter. We men, 90% plus of our identities wrap around our jobs. And that has not been validated as worth praying except for protection. And so that's why when men understand that God anointed them to go into the marketplace to claim back that which the devil stole in the garden, men that seldom pray before become praying men. Because now we go to work and we see work as an expression of worship. 
You know, uh, if we separate labor from worship, we have a problem. We don't have enough time to worship God. We don't have enough time to be active in the church. Because we define church as the building. We describe church as once a week. But in the book of Acts, church was 24-7, every day, everywhere. And this is why I brought up yesterday that while they were listening to this statement, that Jesus uttered to defend himself from having taken the kingdom of God into the home of a successful marketplace leader, he told them a parable, the parable of the miners, and this is a parable where a king or a nobleman who is claiming a kingdom tells his people, do business. There is only one way to do business, only one place, the marketplace, do business. And when you do business the right way, you gain authority. And like Rich highlighted, I appreciate that Rich, is not over one city, it's over many cities. Why? Because the most influential person in the city is the most successful business person in that city, period. There is no way to get around that. So then, the Lord told that parable to explain that before he can take care of his enemies, he has to have his people take positions of authority in cities all over the earth. And that disintegrates this notion that we are waiting just for new heavens and new earth and a new city and this one has to go to hell. No! The Lord came to seek and save everything that was saved. I realize this rattled our theology a little bit. But you search the scriptures and you will see that our Lord is waiting for all things to be put under his feet. And you will see that in the Bible the idea of the harvest is never meager, it's always plentiful. You take every teaching of Jesus that can be quantified, and I showed that in my book, Prayer Evangelism. Every teaching of Jesus that can be quantified shows that minimum 50% of the world population shall be saved. Ten versions are waiting, five make it, five didn't. That's 50%. Two men are on the roof, two are on the field, one is taken, one is left, that's 50%. Two thieves are hanging next to Jesus, one believes, the other doesn't believe, and that's only Jesus. He said, you will do greater works than this. The Holy Spirit was not in the world yet. So when you go through the Bible, you see entire regions where everybody has heard the word of the Lord. And then when you go to the book of Revelations, we read that John says the number of the Gentiles before the throne couldn't be counted, being so many. And then you get to chapter 21, and there you read that nations and kings will bring their honor to the city of God. Oh, folks, listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to the Holy Spirit. The Bible is speaking of nations that are going to be saved. I realize these challenges are, 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 dis, are dispensation and theology, but search the scriptures. That's why as you came in, you found a brochure like this, that I hope you have found it. I mean, we are going in our training conference in Argentina. It's all about marketplace and nation transformation. Argentina imploded financially a year and a half ago. And that forced the church to get out of the building, into the city, to take care of the city, because it was a major crisis. And then the Lord told us, Ed, the Great Commission is not about G12, it's not about church growth, it's not about this or that. The Great Commission is about discipling nations. So what I want everybody to do is disciple the nation of Argentina. And we are claiming the nation of Argentina. And so last year we went to five corners and we raised a canopy of prayer over the nation. And we say, Lord, we are standing on behalf of Argentina because when the nations and the kings bring their honor to you, we want Argentina to be right there. And we did that in the month of November. And the, the country was in total chaos. We went to 2,000 businesses that were going broke and we told them, we are here to pray for the Lord to heal your business. Would you let us pray for you? 
And I wrote the prayer to Jesus the businessman, which is just a two-minute version of my book, Anointed for Business. You know, and I told them, you know, would you pray this prayer with us? All 2,000 businessmen prayed the prayer and invited Jesus into their business. On January 15, the secular press reported that unemployment, for reasons that cannot be explained, decreased 25%. That the GMP, for the first time, went into the black. That looting and rioting stopped completely. And in the city where we visited 2,000 businesses, where we hold our conference, the merchants are having the best season ever. Why? Because we went there and we say, Lord, we are claiming back that which the devil stole from us. We are claiming back the Garden of Eden. And that's why when we understand the three-dimensional nature of our salvation, we can pray on far more solid grounds. You see, we can go there and we can say, Lord, I will not let the devil steal from me. And that's why what I want to highlight before we move into the lesson on wealth and the kingdom of God is this point that is not in your notes, the four ascending levels. When we understand the true meaning of Luke 19.10, we see that we cannot stay at the bottom level just trying to survive in the marketplace, waiting for God to call us into the ministry. You have been called into the ministry. I was so blessed by you, Tamara. I mean, you live this stuff, you know. No matter where you are, you are in ministry, whether you are buying the hamburger or doing who knows what else. But the other level up, and this is what most Christians are in the marketplace. All they are doing is applying biblical principles to prevent the marketplace from changing them. But they have no hope of changing the marketplace. That's why we need to move up to the next two levels. It's not enough to be in the marketplace applying biblical principles. We need to do business in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I have a chapter in Anointed for Business called God in the Boardroom. And I would like to declare that the Lord expects you to perform miracles. The Lord expects you to live out the Christian life. This dichotomizing that I am a secular Christian and you're a religious Christian has no biblical basis. That came from the monks. And monks don't go to work on Monday morning. That's why our theology that embryonically was developed by monks has no paradigm for you to be a minister in the marketplace. We need to reread the scriptures all over again. But it's not enough to do business in the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to do business to bring transformation to the marketplace, like the fellow with the hotel business. In Anointed for Business, I tell the story of a taxi driver. You were telling about the taxi today, Tamara. And this taxi driver, Richard Wilbur, met him in the Philippines when we were together there. He got the message, I am a pastor over my customers. But Lord, I have a problem. As a taxi driver, I don't have a large congregation, two or three people. And I lose my congregation with every trip. What should I do? So the Lord says, I want you to go back into the marketplace, into that bar where you used to get drunk called Sweet Moments. This bar was run by a gay who was a pimp to 35 prostitutes. He was a drug user and a drug dealer. So the place classified as a sinful place. Being a new believer, he had the definite disadvantage. He had no theological training. But being a new believer, he had a definite advantage. He had no theological training. So that everything he read in the Bible, he believed. Nobody told him what not to believe. So he walked into the bar and he declared to the demons there, let it be known that the kingdom of God has come to this bar. And then he sat there, you know, for over two months, eating his lunch and practicing what I show in prayer evangelism, the four steps that brought the devil down and caused no more demonic activity from chapter 11 to chapter 24 in the Gospel of Luke. You bless the lost. You fellowship with them. You minister to them. 
And when a miracle happens, you declare the kingdom of God has come. And he did that and then befriended the gay. And as they were eating and drinking together, the gay shared with him a problem that he had. He prayed for the gay. And the gay said, why would you pray for me? Oh, because God loves sinners. And God answered the prayer. And after God answered the prayer, the gay wanted to know more about it. So he led him to the Lord, and not being properly theologically trained, he didn't know that he was not supposed to baptize him right away, the way they did in the book of Acts. You know, because we don't baptize people. We deep freeze them for six months or so until they become like us, you know. And after they have lost all their fire for the Lord and all that, you know, like Tamara was saying, hey, that's too pushy. So he walked him to the Manila Harbor, sunk him down in the name of the Lord, brought him up, and when the gay came up from the water, the power of God struck him, delivered him from all the demons, rewired him correctly, he became a man, and now he said to the taxi driver, what do we do now? Oh, now the ante has gone up, because now it's two of us. That means we can have church. We're going to take church to the bar. And they began to pray for the prostitutes. And they led all 35 prostitutes to the Lord. It took several weeks. Then they began to pray for the owner of the bar, who is a lawyer. Now, I'm going to tell you what they did, but don't try this at home without medical or adult supervision, okay? They bake a rice cake, something very popular in the Philippines, anointed it with oil, and sent it to the owner of the bar. The moment he ate the cake, he had a power encounter. And he made the beeline for the bar to see what's going on. And there he received the Lord. And now that he received the Lord, he said, what do we do now? Now we're going to turn the bar into a church. But because they were theologically uneducated, you know, you have to give them some handicap. They were not planning of keeping sinners away and putting bars on the window or something like that. They would say, this shall be a house of prayer for every bar we have in our neighborhood. And they began to pray. And after six months, they have led two other bars to become churches as well. And I'll tell you, when you run a bar, you get a lot of sinners without spending a penny in advertising. People just come there, you know, and, and they witness to them. Well, I asked for an update, where are they today? And I got an update about four months ago that the gay has been commissioned, the ex-gay, as a missionary to his hometown where he led 300 people to the Lord and he's pastoring a church of 110 members. The mayor is leading prayer study, Bible studies in the marketplace and has led the mayor to the Lord. And the, and the taxi driver lays hands on new developments over every house, praying for the kingdom of God to be established before anyone moves in. And he's enjoying an 80% salvation rate among new people that move into those houses. So you see, they understood that they are there to bring transformation to the marketplace. Transformation to the marketplace. Last night I shared with you that Paul did not see a major change in his ministry in terms of region uh, transformation until Paul himself went into the marketplace and he teamed up with Aquila and Priscilla. And I need to make a point here, and it's a very important point. So intercessors, I want you to be in prayer right now as I move into this. This division between people that are full-time into ministry and people that have to work for a living has no biblical basis. One of the cornerstones of the, of the Reformation was the priesthood of all believers. We don't need a priest to go to God. Anyone can go to God because of Jesus. But because the time was done right or whatever, they only addressed the vertical dimension of the priesthood. They failed to address the horizontal dimension of the priesthood. And so they left the Catholic model of a professional clergy. 
And if you, God called you, if God called you to leave everything behind and devote yourself totally to pulpit work without any interest in the secular world, that call is from God and I affirm it. But we cannot let that call obscure the fact that 99% of the people don't have that call. But they are still priests. And on the horizontal dimension of the priesthood, they need to turn their job into their ministry. And the tension that was described earlier from this pulpit will not occur if you realize that you are a cook unto the glory of God, or a lawyer unto the glory of God, or a truck driver unto the glory of God. And whether you are driving a truck or settling a case or answering the phone, if you do it unto the glory of God, you are establishing the presence of God in the marketplace. And that opened the eyes of the people to do what Tamara describes so eloquently today, to tell them, would you like to know him? Because when you move into a place in the name of the Lord, people pick up that something has changed. You know, in the old days, I used to go to restaurants and pray for the food. I don't waste my prayers like that anymore. I go to a restaurant and I ask the waiter, you know, when you bring the food, we're going to thank God. How can I pray for you? I still have to be turned down by anyone. We have let people right and left. You know, I pray for their feet. I pray, you know, because they hurt when you are eight hours carrying dishes. I pray for bigger tips. I pray for whatever they need. And that opens their eyes. They say, what is going on here? That's why it's very important for us to understand that some people will be led to quit their jobs to go into full-time pulpit ministry. But making quitting your job a rite of passage to be in the ministry is not only unbiblical, I dare say, is demonic. Because that deprives the church from the top leadership. I mean, we need to pastor corporations. We need to go to places. And that's why I encourage you, you know, get my book. I have a chapter there. If you are not the reading type, get the CD or the cassette version. You will have to put up with my accent, but I did a, the best job I could so that you will understand that. And you will see how God delights himself in, prom, in, in doing extraordinary miracles. Now, yesterday we talked, and by the way, I was so blessed by you, Barry, you know, not just what you said, which was powerful, but your humility. And I have found that the most successful people in the marketplace, they prefer to remain faceless and nameless. You know, this idea that they are, that is not true. There are a few squeaky wheels out there, but most of the wheels are good. <laughs> so now we move into the whole issue of wealth. Because wealth is something that we must acquire if we want to have authority over cities so that we can take care of the evil that is out there. We have a spiritualized poverty. We have made it worthy of aspiring to it. But that comes from the monks. That doesn't come from the Bible. And that's why I need to drop a bomb right now if nothing else to keep you awake. I have a chapter in my book called The God of Business. And this is what I deal with there. One of the things that the devil uses to disqualify marketplace people from seeing themselves as a spiritual people is that they are out there making money. And the devil tells them, you know, you are making money. I mean, you can be a spiritual. That doesn't come from the Bible. And let me prove it to you. When I ask people, why did David fight Goliath? I get all kinds of spiritual answers. Oh, he was a worshiper, you know. He was... No, 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 no. Go to the book. I go to the book and I let the book speak. When David saw Goliath, David was not playing the harp. He was not writing psalms. He was a businessman. He was a junior partner in a family-owned business who was taking some time off to work as a caterer. He's delivering food to the marketplace. Change your glasses, you know, you're going to see it. Like Tamara, Tamara, that description of the women in uh, uh, Proverbs 31, I mean, that's it. I mean, that lady is a businesswoman, period. So the guy arrives there.
He sees Goliath challenging the people of God, and he says, who is this some circumcised Philistine to challenge the armies of the living God? Now, the monastic people get on a spiritualizing tangent and begin to preach. No, 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 hold your horses. David is a businessman, and he's making a business assessment. He's saying this guy can never win because he's done in covenant with God. That's what uncircumcised means. Number two, any of us can win because we are the armies of God. So he's saying this deal is morally right. This deal is doable. And now he asks the question that is important to every businessman. How much money is on the table? He didn't put it that way because, you know, we translated the King James slightly different. But he said, what will it be done to the man that fights him? And now we get into all these spiritual things like his brother, you know. Eliab can say, oh, you wicked man, how can you think of money at a time like this? Go back to your business, you know, keep sending your support money, but don't tell us what to do. Now you go to the text, folks, go to 1 Samuel 16, and David, the Bible says David asked the same question. What's the question? How much money? And he gets the same answer. And the answer is threefold. Number one, you get a tax exemption for your entire household. <laughs> Businessman saying more power to it. Number two, you get access to the circle of power you marry into the king's family. And number three, you get a lot of money. Now, the words keep going, going around, and you read this for yourself, and David's words were referred to Saul. What are the, soul, the words? Somebody's willing to do it for the right price. So Saul tells David, listen, kiddo, I'm the venture capitalist here, and I'm the guy that usually puts money in risky ventures, but I can't put it on you because you are a kid, and he's a professional soldier. Now change your glasses, put the marketplace glasses, and hear David make his case. He says, sir, it is true that I am young, but I'm a businessman. And in my business, I have contracted security services with God. And when shoplifters break into my business, bears and lions, and they steal merchandise without paying, my security service empowers me to capture them, recover the merchandise, and the God of my business is the God of my ministry. Now, why is this important? Now, intercessors, be on prayer here. Be in prayer. Because profit motive, not prophesying, profit, the desire to make money, is to people in the marketplace what the drive to win is to an athlete. It's what a packed stadium is to an evangelist. It's what a growing congregation is to a pastor. What is in it for me? How can I know that this thing is the right thing to do? And so the devil demonizes that so that we will not be able to access the wealth that has been stored by the wicked for the righteous one. And people are still mystically hoping to do it like the people of Israel. Let me tell you, if you do it like the people of Israel, you go to jail. You have to do it somehow different. We need to realize that the prophet motive is a gift from God like sex that has to be sanctified and used according to God's guidelines. But when you do that, you get a lot of re rewards. When we let the devil demonize marketplace people, we end up treating them the way women were treated with regards to sex during the Victorian era. They were told, do it, but don't enjoy it. But make sure you get pregnant because I need an heir to my name. And so we tell marketplace people, well, you know, tough luck, you know, you don't have the call, but I'll pray for you. Go there, hold your nose, you know, don't get too excited about it, but make sure you close that deal and you pay your tithes because I need a new building for my ministry. And it's such a put down. Pastors, I don't mean this to be offensive, I'm just pointing to a fact. But when you can look at somebody like Richard Stachin so eloquently last night, somebody who is going to go into business to be a lawyer or to be, or to be a hotelier or to be uh, who knows what, and you tell them you will go and you will do business and you will do well and you will pastor your corporation and you will bring the kingdom of God, you remove that layer of shame. 
That's why there are two misconceptions, and now I'm tracking with the notes, that often prevent godly Christians from moving enthusiastically into the marketplace. Key word, enthusiastically. One is that success is something that Christians cannot handle well. Time and again, people say, well, you know, God made me fail because he knew that I couldn't handle it. And that could be true. Like Tamara says, if there is sin in your life, I mean, you better clean up. But this idolizing and deifying of failure. Oh, I listen to testimony time and again in Bible school. You know, I could have been number one, but the Lord couldn't trust me with success. And the problem with that is that the secret to win the war is not to die for your country. The secret to win the war is to make the enemy die for his country. You know, if we are going to have authority over cities, if we are going to conquer, we need to win, guys. We need to be like that football game. I forgot the name that Tamara is so excited about, you know. Sorry, I was rooting for the other team, you know. But I bless you, Tamara. I remember when I was a brand new believer, you know, when Tamara was sharing the shock that she got. You know, that happened to me on a different subject. I went to my first youth camp. And I was looking forward to being there. And there a preacher explained how she has worked all her degrees, all her diplomas, threw away all her books because she was afraid that she may become prideful because she was good at, uh, uh, so good at what she was doing. And she was afraid that God will spit her out of her mouth. And so the message was, it's better to be poor and miserable with Jesus than to be successful and not know where you stand with God. And I was so touched by that, that I came home and I told my father, who was not a believer, that I'm going to quit my studies, I'm going to quit my career, because Jesus is coming back soon. And I'm afraid that if I keep at this pace, I was usually successful at everything I did, I will run into pride. My father looked at me and he almost melted me. And he says, son, I don't know this Jesus that you know personally, neither I have a any indication that he's coming back but one thing I know son the only people that have a choice to become humble are successful people because people that fail have already been humbled by their failure so don't you ever come up with that stupid idea or I'll tan your hide and that was the best career counseling I got he said you go there you succeed and when you are in the pinnacle you give God all the glory so in the name of the Lord Jesus, I take authority of every piece of speculation that has, the, that has idolized failure, and I remove that in the name of the Lord Jesus. You can be prideful being, hum and being poor, or you can be prideful being rich, folks. It's the same customs that you have to cross. The third one is, the second misperception is that God, the church unintentionally perhaps teaches that God despises rich people. You know, if, the, if a bag lady walks in here right now, we're going to get instant compassion for her. But if Donald Trump walks in, we will not get the same level of compassion. We are usually more inclined to pray for the janitor than for the chairman of the board. You know, there is something there that is with us. How does God really feel about the rich? Well, God loves the world. That includes the rich and the poor. The church often of exhibits a negative bias because we ascribe virtue to poverty and evil to good. But you know, when you look at Jericho, Jesus is coming into Jericho, and as he is about to come in, he runs into the poorest man, Bartimaeus. He takes care of them, and everybody prays God. Next, he takes care of who could have been most likely the wealthiest man. He takes care of him, and everybody gets mad. Why? He's a sinner. You see? Jesus never, I mean, the Bible doesn't say that Bartimaeus was a godly man. We don't know if he was shacking with another back lady. Or if he was stealing money, stealing money from another beggar when he was not looking. 
I mean, the Bible doesn't say anything, nor the Bible says that Zacchaeus was a sinner. I mean, his enemies call him a sinner. Oh, let the Lord speak to you. Some people are more sinful than others, but we are all sinners. And sometimes we Christians, we miss the plane by one minute, and now we brag to those that miss it by one hour. But whether you miss it by one minute or you miss it by one hour, we both need a new plane or else we're going to be stranded here. Oh, let the Lord speak to you today. That's why he told the parable of the ten minus to correct the following misperceptions. Number one, the rich business people like Zacchaeus have no important place in the kingdom of God. That is not true. Number two, that the kingdom of God will materialize suddenly rather than as a result of a process. Oh, there are people that are all day crying, Lord, come back, come back. Yes, I pray that prayer too, but I'll tell you what, I work my tail off every day to bring that return closer to my lifespan on earth. That's why I want you to consider coming to Argentina. We're going to go on the first weekend, we're going to go to the 24 provinces of Argentina. And we're going to gather the church in 24 stadiums there. And we're going to invite the governor. And we're going to give him tangible proof of things that he can use uh, to help the people and then we're going to take an offering and we are going to give it to the governor in lieu of unpaid taxes by christians and then we're going to connect all 20 because if you have a problem with rats don't blame the rats it's your garbage clean up your garbage and the rats go someplace else Anytime you have a problem in the city, a problem in the nation, it's a magnified expression of a problem that hasn't been dealt with in the church. And that's why we're going to connect the 24 stadiums by television, and the whole nation will be disciples watching hundreds of thousands of Christians on their faces confessing their sins to God. As the first move for the nation to break its will before God. And then if you come the next day, we're going to team you up with your peers. Are you a tractor? We're going to get you with tractors. Are you a lawyer? We're going to get you with lawyers. Are you a preacher? We're going to get you with preachers. Are you a young person with young people? And we're going to have a meal. Sorry about that. We can't fast uh, on that first day, but we'll do it later. <laughs> you know, and uh, we're going to have a meal, and we're going to talk shop. And then at the end, at the same time, all over Argentina, these marketplace people will pray a prayer of impartation over the 40 or 50 people seated around that table. And we're going to give the devil a migrant headache. And then we're going to come in the evening, you know, and have evangelistic rallies all over the nation. And then everybody comes to the main city, Mar del Plata, a city of a million people. And we are already in the process, I'm leaving for Argentina on Monday, of picking up the top 300 people in the 10 categories of influencers. The arts, business, sports, media. And we are scholarshiping them, if they need it, to come to the conference. And there we're going to envision them to go in, into their niche in society. And don't just put up with it, change it for the glory of God. And we are working on a 10-year plan. Because the Lord Jesus didn't say, go and make disciples. He said, go and disciple the nations. How do you disciple the nations? By teaching them, by baptizing them. That's why for 2004, when we bring the people in 24 stadiums, there will be 24 stadium-wide baptism all over Argentina because we want the nation to see that we are being baptized. That's why it's important to realize that, yes, the Lord will come back in the twinkling of an eye, but it's the culmination of a process. The other misperception, I'm sorry, is that wealth, okay, I lost this one, just bear with me. The other misperception, okay, that's it. Now, I want to talk about wealth and authority. Rich people need to be saved so that they can bring the kingdom of God into the city. I mean, we are still in kindergarten. We think that they need to get saved so that they can help us build bigger buildings. That's on the entry point, folks. 
I mean, the buildings that we need for the last revival have already been built. They are called stadiums. I mean, they are going to be you. I mean, they are the most un underutilized buildings on earth, like churches. They are used usually once a week. But on May 1st in Africa, I was so blessed. I was there recently, and I met with Michael Cassidy. Some of you know Michael. And a marketplace guy by the name of Graham Powers. And Graham Powers and Michael Cassidy have teamed up. And on May 1st, they are bringing together the church in 38 nations in 138 stadiums. That's over 4 million people that will come together in one day to cry out to God for Africa to be transformed. Give the Lord a hand over that. And the people behind these are pastors that believe in it, but are business people that have the money for it, but the money is going for the city. And they're going to take offerings and give it to the city and take care of the poor. And that's why it's so important that we understand that the new Zacchaeus is more important than the old Zacchaeus. Wealth is a gift from God that must be brought under the power of God. That's why I want to highlight here the last frontier. You have this in your map there. When you read the book of Ephesians, and I have a chapter here in my book that none should perish, but I explain the reality of the heavenly places. There is a spiritual reality that is invisible. And that spiritual reality generates a natural reality that we can see. And so often we put all our money and our resources in an effort in changing the natural reality instead of going to the supernatural reality and cutting the tree at the root. That's why I was so blessed, Barry, by your testimony about the Lord telling you, I didn't tell you to do any of that. You know, go to the third world. I'm from there, so I thank you on behalf of so many. So when you go to the book of Ephesians, that is a book about city and region transformation, there are six gaps that have to be bridged. The first one is the ethnic gap in chapter 2. The next one is the denominational gap in chapter 3. You know, where God will not use the Baptists or the Pentecostals or the Presbyterians to change a nation. He will use the church that happened to have Baptists, Presbyterians, and Pentecostals. But then you need ministerial reconciliation. Many of the divisions we have are not doctrinal. They are because I'm a teacher and you are a prophet and he is a pastor and the other guy is an apostle. And we are not diligent in maintaining the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. We, make, we try to do it in the bond of doctrine. And that's a recipe for failure. As long as I'm at peace with anyone, I can resolve any misunderstanding. Then you go to chapter 5, and there you have chapter 4, gender reconciliation. This is what this book is all about. Then you go to chapter 6, you have age reconciliation, parent and children. But when you get to the second half of chapter, of cha verse 4 and 5, it's talking about marketplace reconciliation because it's talking about masters and slaves coming together. Now notice this. It's not until the six gaps are bridged that we are told to a struggle against the forces of evil in the heavenly places. So often we come against the devil and we are racist. Or we have pride in our denomination. Or we criticize other ministries that we don't understand. That's why it was a good point in your, in your syllabus there. You know, are you criticizing somebody, you know? Or we don't get along with our wife or with our husband. I mean, the devil will not even waste his breath in opposing you. You're going nowhere. You're bound. But when we take care of these six gaps, that's why our time in Argentina, you want an intense training on marketplace transformation? Come, because we deal with the ethnic thing by going to the native Argentinians. And we already make restitution, we'll continue to make restitution. And then denominations come together. And then different ministries come together. And then we honor women, and women honor us. And then parents and children. And it's not until you have dealt with the last frontier 
that you are given the go-ahead, fire at will. Jesus was never owned by either the poor or the rich. He was free to move from one group to the other. He was born in poverty, but he was buried in wealth. I mean, he had to borrow for a place for the Last Supper, but his uh, robe was sinless, which made it the first century equivalent of an Armani. He was never needy. He always had everything he needed for what he needed to do. He never opposed wealth, never. He objected, and this is the key, underline this in your notes, to idle wealth and the control that idle wealth has on those that have it. What I'm about to share, I was pointed to this by Rich Marshall. You know, Rich was teaching one day, and, uh, and I haven't caught it, Rich, until you taught it. You know, we get this idea that the Lord rejects poor people because he told the young rulers, sell your possessions and give them to the poor. But when you go to the passage in Mark, he didn't say sell your possessions and give them to the poor. He says sell your possession and give to the poor. And there is a big difference because that is more appealing. I mean, if he would have rejected the invitation to become poor, I can sympathize with him. Because I don't know anybody on earth that could do that in a minute. But Jesus was not asking for that. He was saying, you have money and stash away to shore up your insecurities and your fears. I want you to put that money and do business with it so that you can take care of the poor. Now, in the other passage, which is in Matthew, it does say, sell it and give it to the poor. So that now we have a problem there because one gospel says, sell it and give it. The other says, sell sell it and give well when you have a tension like that you apply the laws of hermeneutics and the strongest witness to a verse that is done clear is the context and the context tells us that jesus was not asking him to give everything away because when he told you know it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to come into the kingdom of god the disciples didn't say, yes, Lord, stick it to the rich. Praise God. No, no, they became very troubled. Lord, we have a problem now. Who will be saved? Why did they ask that? Change your glasses. Because they were not poor. They came from a fishing company. They came from tax collection. They came from positions of wealth. And they say, Lord, if the rich cannot make it, we will not make it then. And then... You know, Peter, thanks God for Peter. He always asked the question I would have asked. He said, Lord, what about me? You know, I gave up this, I gave that. Peter, you gave up this, 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 this. You will get that a hundred times or many times here plus eternal life. So the context bears witness to the fact that people that give to the kingdom of God are entrusted with more rather than with less. But what the Lord is questioning here is when people sit on idle money. Let me tell you, board of elders fights and board of director fights are meaner when there is money in the bank. That's why I run an empty bank account. You know, I don't care that I don't have enough money. I trust God every day because that way I don't have to worry as to who would like to lead a coup to take over my job. You have to be crazy to take over my job. Every day I have to trust God for a major breakthrough. And so many tensions that we have have to do with idle money. Why did Jesus tell the young ruler to sell his possessions? Not because wealth is evil, but because he was controlled by wealth. The rich man's problem was that he was just hanging on to money to protect his insecurities. But Paul admonished those who are rich not to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. Have you heard that verse before? That's not a verse, that's half a verse. That's the one we love to torture you with from the pulpit. But let me highlight the second half of that verse. But God who richly supplies us with all things underline richly and all you see 
when you know that what God gave you, God will keep giving on to you, now you get a ticket to generosity. And now when you get things from God and you receive them as a gift from God, you don't feel guilty about it. That's why, you know, it pains me when Christians say, well, you know, we bought this nice house, but we're going to use it for Bible study and to house missionaries. If you're going to do that, do it. But don't use it to justify that maybe you don't deserve it, and now you need to explain and justify why you got it. Say, so, you know, God not only loves me, He likes me. And because He likes me, He gives me good things. Don't apologize over that. You don't want your kids or your grandkids to say, Oh, Daddy, Grandpa, I'm a terrible girl. I don't deserve anything you gave me. That verse says the reason why you shouldn't put your trust in riches is because they come and they go. But God is a rich supplier, and He gives you lots of things for you to enjoy. Wealth is not the problem. It's the attachment to wealth. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And that's why I want to bring upon this. The only way to enjoy our wealth is to share it. Only when you share it, you enjoy it. If you ask me, Ed, give me a fleshly desire that you have that is one inch away from being sinful. You know, something that you say, Ed, what would you like to do that is not highly spiritual but it's not sinful? What would you like in the material world? I'll tell you in a minute. I would like a brand new Lexus 430 with GPS. Off-white color, you know, gold trimming all around that. Yeah. If you give me that, I'll take it. Now suppose that you give it to me. And now I drive it. A day, two days, three days. But then the thing no longer is appealing until I call my friends and I let them drive it. And then we make a trip, and we take other people with us. You see, I enjoy it when I share it, not when I keep it. This is also true of wealth. And, I, and that's why it's so important for us to understand, because we have an insecurity, especially if you have wealth. You are more prone to be insecure about money than poor people. And I show in my book, Prayer Evangelism, and this is also covered in Anointed for Business, that in the book of Acts, and you have the quotes there, and they are in your notes, there are four instances when the people in the church share their possession with the needy, and the number of the disciples increase automatically without a single mention to an evangelistic outreach. Why? Well, go back to the lesson last night. Paul says, by working hard with my hands, I took care of myself, I took care of my team, I took care of the poor, and I gained authority over the city. You see, we are so fixated on the vertical dimension, praise and worship, without favor with the people, that we look like freaks. We should praise and worship less, and we should give more money to the poor and help the needy and help the people that are hurting. So I'm giving you the passages for you to search them. That's why poverty is not lack of. Poverty is fear of lacking. You see, you may have zero dollars in your pocket today, and you trust that God will provide. You are rich. I may have a million dollars and I'm worried about what will happen in post-liberation uh, Iraq, and I'm poor. That's why we need to realize that we cannot be controlled by wealth because then we fail to enter the kingdom of God. We cannot bring the kingdom of God. And that's why in bringing this to a close, I ask the Lord and I say, Lord, how should we is there a book in the Bible that talks about reconciliation between the rich and the poor? Is there a book that I can point to? And the Lord says, yes, there is one. It's very short. It's the book of Philemon. When you look to the book of Philemon, Philemon was a very wealthy man because we know that he had a house big enough to house a church. He has guest quarters for Paul and his entire team. He has refreshed the saints. That means he made their lives enjoyable. And also, 
he had slaves. Poor people don't have slaves. Now Paul addresses Philemon and calls him my son and my servant. And then he tells him, and I'm sending home Onesimus, my son that I begot in jail. And he is also my servant. So look how Paul uses the same word picture to describe a master that he uses to describe a slave. And he says, you are a wealthy man, and I'm proud to be called your father. And you are a wealthy man, and it's your privilege to be my servant. And Onesimus is a slave, and I'm proud to call myself his father. And it's his privilege to be my servant. And then when you scrutinize the parable, the, the, the epistle, Paul says, but I could keep him, but I don't want to keep him because I'd rather send him back to you so that you will be partners and brothers. That's the ultimate picture of reconciliation. Now look what Paul says. I could keep him, but I choose not to. Why? Because he's dealing with the issue of giving out of compulsion and this is a problem that people with money have should i give how much should i give i mean people write me nice letters they call me they take me on trips they show me things if i don't give i feel like like a terrible person you see if you have no money you never struggle with compulsion if I need $10,000 and I plead, you say, Ed, I'll pray for you. I don't have anything. But if you're sitting on $10,000, now you have a problem. What do I do? So I'd like to suggest, in closing, a business plan. And it's this. Pick a figure that you need to live on, that you are comfortable with. And be very generous to yourself. You know, don't be falsely spiritual by starving yourself to death. Luxury is not a sin. The love of luxury is a sin. If you have any doubts about this, let me refer you to the book of Revelation and ask God what kind of pavement he chose for his city. What kind of gates he chose. Some people can live with heads down and other people need designer's clothes. That's the way we are, folks. There is no sin in it if you are not controlled by it. So pick a figure that you are comfortable with. Having picked that figure, make two decisions. Decision number one is that you will honor what you are about to make as decision number two. That every penny that you get over that figure, you will immediately give it to the poor and the needy. You will never, never, never face the issue of compulsion again. Why? Because you know what you got. You need a million dollars a year, you got a million. Now God gives you two million. You know what to do with a second million. You already have that. I mean, make provision for your kids, pay their college education, give them a house, give them something, and don't give them too much beyond that because you're going to spoil them. And I began, you know, when God began to speak to me about this, I don't like to preach about something that I don't live. So my wife and I, through the years, have always been working us up in our giving. And I began to declare that the day will soon come when marketplace people will give away every month, on the average, 50% of their wealth. Because they will realize that God is a provider and he's a generous provider. So we have been working us up on our giving. I'm not at 50%. We are not there yet, but about 42%. But one thing I can tell you. As I began to share this and tell this to people as an expression of desire, I have been amazed to run into so many people that are already doing this. At our conference last year in Argentina, I gave the pulpit to five marketplace people. These are kind of my team of these. And four of them surprised me by testifying that they are already giving 50% or more every month. Now you say, well, Ed, that is a little bit threatening. Yes, it's as threatening as tithing for the first time. 
because when you were invited to tie the first time, I remember I was broke, I didn't have enough money, and I said, Lord, I cannot pay my bills with 100% of my paycheck. How can I pay it with 90%? But the Lord says, Ed, it's a spiritual exercise. Trust me. Trust me that will open the windows of heaven. And so my mother and my sister and I, I was a teenager when this happened, we began to do that out of obedience. We didn't have any pleasure doing it, but we did it. And within three months, we were out of debt. And what I discovered is this. The reason why people are doing it is because the joy of giving it away far exceeds the pleasure of keeping it. Everything that God wants us to do, he coated with pleasure. He wants us to have babies, so it's fun to engage in the process. He wants us to take care of our bodies by eating. So eating has a very narrow section here that feels real good. Everything that God wants us to do, he coats with pleasure. So listen to the Holy Spirit right now. Because you can go through life worrying day in and day out. How much should I give? Who should I give to? Or you can make a decision today that will free you forever. And when you make that decision, two things will happen very soon. Number one, you will get income over the ceiling that you set. And number two, as you give it away, you will begin to lower the ceiling. Because the joy of giving it away far exceeds the pleasure of keeping it. My wife and I made the decision to turn all our books and all our texts to the Lord. We say, Lord, we will not take anything, not even royalties. Now, if you buy at the bookstore, I do get a royalty. But if you buy from us or you buy at one of our conferences, I don't get a penny. When we made that decision, our monthly income was about $1,000 in tapes. Today is about a quarter of a million dollars a year. Could be $10 million next year. It will never be a temptation because it's over the ceiling. It's over the ceiling. And we put it in the third world country ministry. We send it there. It goes there. Why? The joy of giving it away. At our conference, one of these four businessmen told us how in 98, you know him, he's Miles Kawakami. Um, he was there and uh, he thought he was safe. His wife says he was not, so I believe his wife. And so uh, during a move of God, you know, when the anointing of God was causing people to fly in all different directions, Miles came forward and he received the Lord. And the Lord told him, Miles, I want you to pray two hours a day. And he was under the power, so he agreed. Two o'clock in the morning, he woke up in a cold sweat and said, what have I done? I promised God to pray two hours a day when praying five minutes is a stretch. So what do I do? Being a businessman, he filed for chapter 11. He told God, I cannot pay my obligations. Can I bargain? And God said, sure. How, how long can you pray? I can pray five minutes. Okay, pray five and keep going up until you hit two hours. At the moment that this happened in 1998, Hawaii, where Miles and Joyce live, was having the worst economic downturn of recent times. His company was expected not only not to make money, but to end up $70,000 in the red. But he finally hit the two hour a day prayer time. He began to pastor his corporation. He began to claim out to God for blessings and fight the devil. And then one day the Lord told him, Miles, I want you to give me 50% of your company. Be the savvy business. And say, okay, Lord, I'm projecting a loss of 70,000. So you want to owe me 35,000 come January 1st? Deal, it's all yours. So he agreed. He said, but remember, this is a deal for life, not for this year. Okay, Lord. Then a few weeks later, the Lord told him, this year you're going to clear $120,000. I want you to give 50% to the poor. At the end of the year, he cleared 50000 That added to the 70 he was going to lose is 120. The next year, he cleared 120000 cash. He gave away sixty. 
The following year, he cleared 250,000. He gave away 125. Last year, he cleared half a million dollars. He gave away a quarter of a million dollars. And then he told us, I'll be stupid not to give God 50% but the 50% that I keep is far more than the 100% I would have kept if I would have gone solo. So let the Lord speak to you today. Let the Lord speak to you and let him activate the anointing for business. Last night, Pastor Rich very eloquently, you know, point us in that direction, says, I want to commission you. And now what I want to do, I want to shake you up in the name of the Lord, you know, for that anointing to be activated, for you to be, to be so sensitive to the Word of God this morning that you will realize that every gift, every good thing that you have comes from God, and God is a generous replenisher. Would you listen to the Lord now and let Him tell you, you know, that even if you make mistakes, He will make up for those mistakes. Look at the lesson that Barry shared this morning. I mean, he would have never learned that lesson had he not made the mistake. But his heart was right. It's just his mind that threw him off. Oh, how many of you are here today that you really, really need to go into the marketplace and begin to operate in this anointing? When you read my book, you will see that I go through the miracles that Jesus performed. There are no ethereal miracles, no mystical miracles, no people floating on clouds miracles. The miracle has to do with a caterer that blew it. And he said, don't worry, give me water, I'll turn it into wine. It has to do with April 15, and Peter, who couldn't pay the taxes, says, I'll tell you where to catch a fish with enough money for your taxes and my taxes in it. Some of you desperately need a financial miracle and you have dare not pray for it because somehow you feel that it's unspiritual to pray for a miracle. But let me tell you, if you're going to do business and do well and gain authority, you need a miracle not once a year, you need a miracle every day. So how many of you need a miracle in your life? I mean, don't be ashamed. Lift up both hands. Say, Lord, I need a miracle. I need a miracle. I need a miracle. And you are the God of miracles. So would you stand up with your hands up and say with me loud and clear, Father God, I surrender all. Everything. I surrender it to you. My speculation. My thoughts. My fears, my insecurities, my hopes, my dreams, everything, I surrender all. And now in the name of Jesus, I empty myself before you. Take my thoughts captive, all of them, and now release back to me. Only your thoughts. I receive them, Lord. I receive the anointing. And now in the name of the Lord Jesus, I call on you to activate the anointing for signs and wonders in the marketplace, for miracles, extraordinary miracles, extraordinary miracles in the marketplace I am submitted to you and now I resist the devil and I say to the devil Satan in the name of Jesus be gone in the name of Jesus I am anointed for the marketplace my job is my ministry and I declare that when I go back to work and I walk through the door, your kingdom will come to the workplace and the gates of hell shall not prevail. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much. 
Let me encourage you, if you would like to talk about the trip to Argentina, I'm going to be here for a few minutes. Get the books. And for your students, if you cannot afford the book, go to our website and you can download for free the first four chapters, or anybody can do that. God bless you. You are an awesome group of people. Don't forget the doors open at 6 o'clock this evening. Let's take the anointing out to the marketplace, the restaurants, hotels.